Welcome to another video lecture. This time we are going to be talking about a man named Ibn Battuta. So this week we are talking about the expansion of Islam. And when we think about the expansion of Islam, I think there's a typical mindset or a framework or story that comes to most people's minds. And that is Islam spread rapidly and it spread across the world and spread through violence. That story is not 100% wrong. There was a lot of violence. Um, the Muslims of that time period did expand in a way that included the military. Uh, they developed multiple different types of empires. And even within Islam, remember, we had a division. The division was between the Shia and the Sunni sects. The uh, Shia were people who believed that the um, ancestry of, of Muhammad was what determined leadership. So if you were from the bloodline of Muhammad, you would become the leader. Uh, the Sunni believed that the next leader within Islam should arise sort of organically, should arise spontaneously, led by Allah. Uh, the next leader would be the person who showed the most knowledge of Islam, showed the most charisma of Islam. I was like thinking of it as like a captain of a football team, right? Or a captain of a sports team, or if you're in theater, or if you're in choir or whatever. Who are your student leaders who tend to get chosen for leadership? And they're usually pretty talented people, but they're not necessarily the most talented person in the group. Why? Because the reason why they're chosen is they're talented, but they're also great leaders. They can really help people uh, to follow what you want them to follow. So within Islam, there was a fight between the Shia and the Sunni over leadership. So in some ways, that narrative or story about violence coming out of Islam is not 150% wrong. Where it does get wrong, though, is the belief that only Islam was doing this. In fact, at this time period, if we think about it, all the empires were expanding through violence, through military, and through internal division. So what story do we get then about the expansion of Islam? Well, let's look at a particular individual that might help us out with that. And his name is Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta is one of our first world explorers. So we tend to think of world explorers like uh, Christopher Columbus or so forth. Well, actually, Ibn Battuta is our first. So Ibn Battuta traveled. He was born in and lived within the Middle East. But he would travel everywhere from East Asia out to Western Africa. And this brings up kind of an interesting story about this issue. So even due to travel this entire area, and when you look at that as like a history student, you might look at that and say, whatever, man, that happened in history, let's move on. But just think about it this way. What if you were to tell me that today you were gonna pick up, leave your house, and travel the entire United States? Okay, that's not even being correct. Let's say you were to say, I'm going to travel from Canada to the United States, down to Mexico, and down into Central America. And that's today with roads and highways, hotels, uh, fast food places, all that stuff, right? That would be a really difficult trip to take. Even Batuta is going to travel in a similar way from East Asia all the way out to Western Africa. And this is during a time when none of those modern conveniences exist, which really brings up a question, how was he able to do this? So this brings up a really big question about this travel that took place. How was he able to do this? So in Ibn Battuta's travels, he traveled all the way, like I was saying, from Eastern Asia all the way out to uh, Western Africa. You think of like India out to Northern Africa. At this time period, this was called Dar al-Islam. What does that mean? It means the house of Islam. This doesn't mean that there was one empire that stretched all the way out. In fact, there were multiple caliphates or Islamic kingdoms. You might remember the first Islamic kingdom that was established was called the Umayyad Kingdom. They were a Sunni kingdom up in Damascus, Syria. The second one that would be established is called the Abbasid. They were a Shia, and they were down in what today is Iraq, and their capital was Baghdad, um, and they were very influenced by Persian culture. And then after that time period, there were numerous caliphates and kingdoms throughout this region. But what tied them all together was that they were Islamic. And it didn't even matter whether you were Shia or if you were Sunni. What tied you together was you were basically a follower of one God, Allah. And on top of that, that you followed his messenger, Muhammad, who wrote down the words of Allah in the book, the Quran. And you might remember one of the things about the Quran that's really important. So the Quran is similar to the Bible in the sense of being the holy word of the religion, but there's a huge difference. The Quran is not written like the Bible is. The Bible is written with a whole variety of stories and laws and dramas and romance stories and all that sort of stuff. That's not the Quran. The Quran is basically a list of laws. If you go and look at the Quran, it is one law after the next, it's broken up into numerous chapters, but basically all of it is law, which means the Islamic faith is a legal religion. Why does that matter? Well, 
Ibn Battuta was what we call a Qadi. A Qadi within the Islamic religion is a judge. That means that his job was to go around and not only understand the Islamic religious law, but then to apply it. And everywhere he went in these Islamic kingdoms, he would be hired, like most Qadis, in order to explain the law. Now, why does that become so important? Well, as he went from one place to the next, whether it was China, India, or Northern Africa, or the Middle East, in each area, he was hired by people to act as a Qadi, and he was protected in those areas to act as a Qadi, to interpret the law. What does this tell us about Islam throughout this area? It was united around legal principles that established legal equality and legal security. And that is why he was able to travel from place to place, and there's only one account, only one time, when he says that he was attacked by bandits up in northern India, right around that Silk Road area. This is amazing when you think about it because it demonstrates how law united all of these people together. So um, Ibn Battuta traveled basically the entire Islamic area from East Asia all the way out to Northern Africa, hardly ever faced any problems, was put up regularly by people in households uh, in order to take part as a Qadi in pronouncing the Islamic law. And he would help numbers of different people. Now, there was a group that he came across many times that will be important for us in Islam, and they were called the Sufi. The Sufi are a third group within Islam. Uh, the Sufi are very similar to groups that we see in other religions, too. They are what we call mystical religious people. What do we mean by that? For the Sufi, they approach God not by law. They don't even approach God by the Quran. They approach God by experience and by emotion. So for the Sufi, when they went from place to place, they would try to attract people based upon their experience of God, their experience of Allah. And they tended to be the ones who were the most successful in doing that. Why? Imagine for a moment if you're in a discussion with somebody and they say, I'm going to tell you all about God. And now I want to sit down and talk to you about all my interpretations of the Bible and church teachings. Probably not all that exciting, right? But if somebody comes up to you and says, I think you really ought to believe in God, and here's why. I'm going to tell you about my life story. And I want you to hear about how God has had a real impact on the things that have happened in my life. And I think the same is true probably for you. You're probably going to have a lot more appeal to that person's personal story. And that's what the Sufi did. The Sufi tended to be people who appealed to other people. Okay, so what's the significance then of Batuta's travels? What should we take away from this? There are a number of things I think we should see about this. First up, remember what I talked about. Batuta traveled all the way from China to Northern Africa. That means Islam stretched out over all those areas. The other thing that I think is so important that comes out of that is how Islam unified all these areas under common principles, common principles of faith, common principles of the law. The other thing that's important is how he worked. Even Batuta was a Qadi, a judge. That means that he is interpreting the Islamic religion through law that tells us something about what Islam tended to be about. Now, one thing about Ibn Battuta I think is important is that he married several different wives. Uh, Islam allowed for that. Islam allowed for a limited number of polygamy uh, for people at this time period. Keep in mind where Islam was coming from as to why it would have done that. Islam came from the Saudi Arabian desert where tribes allowed for unlimited polygamy. Uh, Muhammad did put a limitation on that, but allowed for polygamy to take place. Why is that important? I think it is important for us to, to recognize that there was complexity in the Islamic religion. On the one hand, Islam preached legal security, legal equality of all people. At the same time, it allowed, and it did allow for rights of women. Uh, women were allowed to divorce. Women were allowed to own property. At the same time, women, uh, men could marry multiple wives. That put women into an unequal status. Uh, for people of other religions, they were called the Dahimi, or the second, or, or people of the book. Uh, the Dahimi were treated equally in the sense that they were considered Jews and Christians to be the people coming up until the revelation of Islam. But they also had to pay a tax. The tax was called the Jizya tax. The Jizya tax was a replacement tax for serving in the military. Jews and Christians were not allowed to do that because they were non-Muslim. Uh, and within the Quran, you cannot kill a Muslim if you are non-Muslim, so you can't serve in the military. So on the one hand, that was kind of nice. Jewish people and Christian people didn't have to serve in the military, but because they didn't pay this tax, they were considered to be second-class citizens. So Islam is a very complicated religion. It spreads not just through military and conquest, but also through legal equality, legal security. It also treated people equally in ways that we didn't see in the rest of the world, but it also in many ways created new existing hierarchies more so for women and for minorities of other religious faiths. 
So hopefully this gives you a little bit of background. It's going to help you out with your primary source documentation and gives you a little bit more context into what the religion of Islam was and why it expanded out so much. See you in class. Thank you.